time. Um, but yeah, viruses can target really any species. So first let's talk about what a virus actually is. So you may have heard these words before. So DNA or RNA, maybe you haven't heard of RNA, but DNA is the genetic code. Okay, so it's a special molecule, which means it's just a bunch of atoms. So it's, a, it's really, really small. And it's created in such a way that it can store all the unique information about an organism. And when I say an organism, I mean really anything. Like plants have DNA, animals have DNA, every living thing has DNA. So what's special about uh, a virus is that it's really, really small. And essentially all it has is this DNA in the center, um, and which, which, which is essentially the code to make up that virus. Or it can also have something else called RNA. And you may have heard of RNA before because it's it really it's really related closely related to DNA, but we're not going to get into the differences really. And besides this little information molecule here, which has the code for everything that makes up the virus, it's also surrounded by a protective coating. Because if it's just DNA or RNA by itself, it's really delicate. Like imagine if you're trying to uh, carry around some string, all right, and that string is really important to you, except you're just carrying it like in your hands. You want to have some kind of a box, right, to keep the string safe because string can just get lost or you know, get broken down. So that's why this thing has something called a capsid. It's sort of like the word capsule, except it's, uh, you know, it sounds cooler pretty much. So you can see that you've probably seen something like this before, um, if, like when you search up an image of a virus, for example. And that's really what it is. It's just a capsid with DNA or RNA in the center. So what do viruses really do? So when you get sick and you look like this, you might wonder what's happening inside your body. So, oh, someone is asking what's a capsid again. So if, you, if I go back to this slide, a capsid is just the protective outer coating. So everything here that's in purple, that's not this little helix kind of thing in the center, everything outside is just the, called a capsid. So it's like a protective box. So yeah, if you ever get sick like this and you have the flu or something, you might wonder what is actually happening inside your body. So what actually is a virus and what does it do? So really what a virus is, it's like a hijacker. If you ever heard the word hijack before, you would know it means something like you take over something. So if somebody hijacks a car, that means they just take the steering wheel in their hands and they take control of the car. So what a virus does is it hijacks a cell. It comes into the cell, it breaks in using some special machinery that we'll talk about in a bit. And what it does is it forces the cell to make copies of the virus. So instead of, so if you, usually if you think about a cell, you'll think that the cell is producing a bunch of stuff that's really important to you. Like your, um, your skin cells make pigment and your, um, your our bone marrow cells make red blood cells or something like that, you know? So usually your cells making stuff that's important to keep you healthy, to keep your body safe. But the virus invades the cell and it uses that machinery. It uses the special uh, stuff that your cells have to, ha to make proteins. It uses that to make copies of the virus instead. So what happens is the virus makes so many copies using the cell's machinery that the cell just explodes. And the cell explodes and all the new viruses are released into the human body. So that's, you know, that, that you really don't want that happening. And the reason you get sick is because your body is trying to, is, is really going crazy, trying to keep you safe and trying to kill all the viruses. Because you don't want viruses using your own cells to, you know, make copies of themselves. And here are a bunch of pictures of viruses showing you what viruses, uh, what, what they can cause, what kind of diseases. Um, a really important disease, it's pretty rare, but it's really important, is it's called AIDS. And it's caused by a virus called HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus. So you know what human means. It affects humans. Immunodeficiency, it's, it has to do with the immune system. And deficiency means that it's damaged or it's like low. So what this virus does is it damages the immune system. So you can't fight off diseases. And that's why a lot of people end up dying. And you also have something called a herpes virus, which can cause warts. And you have the influenza virus, which a lot of you might have heard of, which causes the flu. And you know, you have you can even have viruses like hepatitis B, the virus that causes that, can result in cancer. 
So some viruses are really dangerous and some can just cause something like the flu. And it really depends. It, they're really a diverse type of you know, thing. So like I said earlier, viruses can literally affect any living thing pretty much. It's not just us animals. And I mean, yeah, you can get the common cold. It's caused by something called the rhinovirus. But the common cold isn't just really what, what viruses are. There's so much more. So yeah, viruses can infect animals, but they can also infect plants. So if you've heard of the plant tobacco, hopefully you have, and you've may, you maybe heard of tobacco and like cigarettes or something. Uh, don't, don't, don't smoke kids. But yeah, so tobacco is a plant. It has leaves just like any other plant, you know? Um, and an example of a virus that infects plants is something called the tobacco mosaic virus. So uh, we'll look at that in a second, but you know, just to show you the viruses can also infect plants. And one really important thing that you might not have heard of is that viruses can infect bacteria. So bacteria are cells, just like plant cells or animal cells, except bacteria cells, you know, they look a little funny and they have a bunch of interesting things about them. Bacteria cells usually, you know, they just swim around in like some kind of water or something. And they're living things too. So viruses can infect bacteria. And they, these have a special name because they're so important. The viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages. So you don't need to know how to spell that word off the top of your head, but you should just know it in case, you know. Um, so remember the word bacteriophages because that just means viruses that infect bacteria. So um, what you would really call viruses are parasites. So this doesn't mean that they're like a tapeworm or something like that. But by parasite, I mean something that can't live by itself. So imagine you have, um, okay, imagine you have a stray cat that's just wandering up and down the street, okay? So the stray cat, one day it comes up to your doorstep because it can't find any food by itself and it just growls at you and it, it threatens to bite you, um, something like that. So the cat doesn't have anything to do anymore. It, it, it has no other choice. It can't live by itself. So it comes to you, it gets really mad at you and it scares you and it makes you feed it. So viruses just pretty much barge into cells because they have no way of surviving by themselves. And what they do is, like we said earlier, they just invade cells, they break in and they make copies of themselves. And uh, that's why we call them parasites because a parasite is anything that makes use of another organism's machinery to either survive or make copies of itself. And like we said earlier, viruses have some information molecule that codes for, that, that tells the cell how to copy it. So you can think of this as a recipe of how to make a virus, except it's really small and it's, in, it's stored in a special molecule. So this is either DNA, which is the same molecule that makes us up and all living things, or it can be RNA, which is something closely related to that. So Shri is asking, are viruses alive? So we will get to that question in a second. That's a very good question. That's, a, that's something that scientists have really been struggling with, but we have to talk about what alive means. And we'll get to that at some point later in the PowerPoint, not yet. So yeah, viruses, uh, the viruses, one defining property about them, which is something that's unique to them, is that when they break into something like some cell, and we call this a host cell because it's hosting the virus, the virus directs the synthesis of a new virus. So that means that it tells the new cell that it's invading the recipe of how to make that virus. And then it forces that cell to make more of it. And then once it makes too much, it just bursts open the cell and all these new viruses infect other cells. So since we're talking about cells a lot, it's probably useful to know what a, what a cell is, you know, and, uh, you know, what's the defining properties of a cell. So usually the cells that we're going to talk about here, they have, you know, three main parts. So if you think about a factory, okay? So think about a factory. And so the first thing for a factory is that you want to make sure you know what's coming in and out of the factory. So you might have stuff coming in like deliveries and boxes that are important to keep the factory running. And this would be analogous to the membrane of a cell. So membrane just means a layer pretty much. So each cell has a layer outside of it, which uh, protects it from the outside. So this lets some stuff come in and uh, 
it, it keeps some stuff out that you don't want coming in. So the first step for a virus, just a heads up, is that it needs to find a way to break into the cell. So it needs to get past this membrane. The second part of a factory that you can think of is something called the cytoplasm. So if you've heard that word before, uh, you might remember it from biology class. So cytoplasm is really where everything in the cell happens, pretty much. This is where all the proteins are made. This is where all, this, all the exciting stuff is happening in a cell. So anything you can think of that happens in a cell, well, most things you can think of, like making pigment or making special proteins that help your eye see, something like that. But all the proteins in a cell and all the energy, you know, the metabolism, breaking down food, that's all happening in the cytoplasm. And this is like really the, this is ground zero of the factory. This is the assembly line and everything. This is where the stuff is being made. And in the factory, you also probably have a little secret room or like a vault where the secret, you know, um, not the recipe, but like the instructions are held for making the, whatever the factory is making, you know? So this is what you might say the nucleus is. It has some special instructions in the form of DNA, like we said earlier, that are pretty much like a recipe or like instructions for making all the stuff that's important to the cell. So just to recap, we have the nucleus, which is where the instructions are to make everything that the cell is supposed to make. You have the cytoplasm, which is really ground zero. It's where everything is being made. So it's like if in a factory, it's like the assembly lines, the workers are all here. And then you have the membrane, which is like the gate to a factory or the outer wall, controlling what comes in and comes out. So in the center, we said that we have DNA or RNA, right? So this is in the center of a virus. So what are these molecules? What do these look like? What do they do? So DNA, if you come to any of our earlier sessions, you might remember that DNA codes everything about you. It, it's what we call the genetic information molecule because it's everything that makes you up. So it's all stored in this little molecule that looks like this. Like if you have a ladder and you twist it around, it's, look, it's gonna look like this, a helix. And um, this is stored in the center of the cell in the nucleus and it's kept very safe from everything on the outside, okay? So this is like in a cell, each, in each cell you have a large DNA molecule, you have several of them that, and when you combine them, it's what makes you, you. And RNA looks sort of similar to this, except it's just instead of two things twisting around each other, it's just one thing twisting around. That doesn't really matter. But know that both of these are information storing molecules. So they have information about what makes that organism that organism, that what information is unique to that. And that's why a virus needs some one of these to serve as like a recipe or like instructions for how to make that virus. So, I mean, I said a virus was really tiny, but I mean, cells are also really tiny and a bunch of other stuff is tiny, right? So how small is a virus really? So, um, so we're getting a question. So what is RNA? So RNA, like I said earlier, it's just a molecule that's really similar to DNA, except, you know, it's just closely related to DNA. Where your, your cells have it, so um, what they do is they copy DNA to make RNA, which is a related molecule, and then they use that to make proteins. But structurally, the difference between DNA and RNA is that DNA has two of these ladders twisting around each other, and RNA just has one. You can think of them, you can think of them as like very similar. Yeah, sorry, you so were asking. Isn't it, so isn't it co like called ribonucleic acid? Yeah, yeah. So uh, DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is called ribonucleic acid. And that has to do with uh, an oxygen molecule. Deoxy in this case means without an oxygen molecule. This means with. And it really has to do with some chemistry that I think we can't really get into here. But yeah, there is a difference and it's mainly just a structural difference, meaning it's the way that those molecules are built. I think it goes like to the ribosomes or something and it's allowed to get out of the nucleus yeah exactly yeah i wasn't planning on going into that but really the way that it works is that dna a uh, good job by the way dna is stored in the nucleus it's really secret and rna is usually used as a copy of those instructions so yeah it, rna is just sort of like uh, a copy like if you use a copy machine to make a copy of some instructions that's what rna is but some viruses also use that as their as the way that they store DNA.
And then the RNA is read by these things called ribosomes, which makes proteins. Um, yeah, so we're getting a, another question from Sri. Do viruses come from another living thing to you? Yeah, so most likely the way you get a virus is if you have like a dog, for example, that passes a virus to you, or even more likely if you have another human that passes the virus to you by coughing or touching you or something. That's really the way that viruses spread. And you can also have viruses that are airborne or they're on a surface, and that means that they're just floating around for a short period and they're just not doing anything. They're just waiting to find a cell to infect. So if you have like somebody who coughs on a table and they're infected with COVID-19 and you touch that table right after, then that means that that virus could still just be hanging out, waiting for you to touch it and put it on your face or something, and it's going to infect your cells. So that's it. And a virus can't really survive for very long if it doesn't have a host cell, since it needs something to make copies of itself. Otherwise, it's going to die, right, without any copies. So that's why it doesn't really last for very long in midair, just floating around or on a surface, it dies after a while. But if it's in a human, it can live for longer. So yeah, Shri, you raised your hand. You can just unmute and ask, or you can type it in the chat. Wait, so a virus is a living thing? Okay, so I'll, I'll actually just answer that right now. So if you think of a living thing, um, you probably think of something that maybe it moves around, or maybe it uh, grows, or it breaks down food. So actually, a virus doesn't grow, it doesn't break down food, and it doesn't reproduce by itself. It can't make copies of itself without something else to, you know, host it. So I think I can find a slide here. Here. So really, it's up to scientists to decide what is alive and what isn't alive. It's, it's really weird because if you think of alive as like, you know, a plant is alive and dead as a rock is not alive. Except with viruses, it's really di difficult to define because viruses don't breathe. That means they don't take in oxygen and put out CO2 or the other way around. Um, so that's something that usually most living things do. They don't metabolize and metabolize just means they break down food to get energy. They don't grow. And you know what grow means. They don't grow bigger. They don't break down energy to get more cells, but they do reproduce. And reproduce just means make copies. Um, and they can only do this if they have a cell to use their, that machinery to make a copy. Um, but yeah, it, it can't do it by itself. So it's, it's really just a matter of what we define to be alive and dead. So I guess well, it's up to you, you know. Well, actually, so like with COVID-19, you know how like it goes inside, like um, it goes inside your cell and like stops your breathing. Mm -hmm. So would it be like it like... Um, and it like multiplies itself, would it, since it's multiplying by the help of uh, like another cell? So yeah, what so, do you, oh yeah, sorry, continue, keep going. So is some. that basically, um, is that basically, would you call it a living thing? So, I mean, yeah, so what it's using is like your body, your body is made up of like a trillions of cells, all right? Like everything in your body is made of cells pretty much, like your hair, your skin, your lungs, everything. So what the virus is doing, when it infects you, it's going into your cells. Like, like for example, like a skin cell that you have, or maybe like a cell in your lungs or something. So it goes, it breaks into that cell, and then it makes copies of itself. So it's using the help of your cells, like your human cells, to make copies of the virus. So that's, that's just what it does. When I, when I mean it's using the help of a cell, that's what I'm saying. It, it uses human cells. And... I wouldn't say that really means it's a living thing because all it's doing, it's just like a little machine that makes copies of itself using human machinery. But yeah, like I said, it's really up to you and it's up to scientists to see what we define as alive and dead. And okay, yeah, that, thank yeah, thanks. That, that, was, that was a really good question. So yeah, um, I don't know if I ever talked about this graph, but yeah, you can see that animal cells, which are, you know, like the cells in your body or your dog's body, and they're a little bit bigger than bacteria. So bacteria are smaller than these animal cells. And viruses are really, really small, as you can see here. They're smaller than bacteria. They're smaller than your cells. They're really tiny. So a good comparison is if you imagine your classroom, I know you guys haven't been going to school in person, but if you imagine your classroom that you go, go to at school, then it is a cell, then an average, average virus would be 
like the size of a little baseball or softball that you can hold in your hand. So a virus is really tiny compared to a big cell. And that's because it's so simple, right? It's just a box with a bunch of DNA or RNA inside it. So what does a virus look like when you think about it? So a virus is, you know, a virus can have a really diverse, oh, sorry, Shri, are you still raising your hand for a question? No, I want to, I forgot to. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, if anyone has a question, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just unmute and say it and type it in the chat. So yeah, this is an example of what some viruses look like. It's called a helical capsid. And like I said, cap a capsid is the protective outer coating of a virus. So it's what protects the RNA or DNA in the center. So a helical capsid means that the capsid, the protective layer, looks like a helix, which means it looks like, you know, a ladder twisted around or like a spring. So a helical capsid just pretty much looks like this. Under a microscope, it looks like a little rod. So that's just one example. And what we talked about earlier, the tobacco mosaic virus is a virus that infects plants. It infects plant cells, specifically of the tobacco species, you know? And it looks like this. It's like a helical structure. You can't really see the spring shape because it's under a microscope, but you know, it's, it's coiled up really tight and it just looks like this. There's not a particular reason why it looks like this and not like a sphere. It's just an example of what viruses can look like. You can also have viruses that have um, this kind of capsid, like it's, a, it's what we call an icosahedron, if you want to get fancy, but it's really just a 3D shape. It's like a ball that's a little flat on the edges. It's sort of like a polygon. Um, and this is what they look like on our microscope. They look like balls, except they have little edges on them. So an example of that is an adenovirus. So an adenovirus is, you may have gotten infected with it before, so the virus that causes the common cold, the rhinovirus, is an example of an adenovirus. So it's just like a classification, just like a dog is a canine. Um, and it also causes some stuff like pink eye. So somebody says they look so realistic. I mean, yeah, because this is a real image of what they are under a microscope. So I guess it is realistic, you know. Um, okay. So now these look really, really cool. They look like aliens or something, right? I think it's just, you know, it's really cool what nature can create if it's just left to itself. And this is what we call a bacteriophage. So a bacteriophage is really, it's a really interesting piece of machinery because if you look at it, the structure is really complex, right? It looks like one of those robots from sci-fi movies or something. So what it does is, like we said earlier, bacteriophage by definition is just a virus that infects bacteria. So bacteria are cells, just like your cells or plant cells or anything. Bacteria are cells, and they can get infected by viruses too. So yeah, these are called phages for short, or bacteriophages, and they have a really special structure that involves legs that grab onto the cell and a little injecting kind of thing, and they have a little spot to store their RNA or DNA, and they just inject it into the cell. So um, yeah. And one final thing is we also have something called an enveloped virus. So that means it has an extra protective coating around it. It has a membrane just like a cell. And that just, you know, helps protect it from the cell because it looks a little, you know, it looks similar to what a normal cell is like. So it helps it stay secret inside the body. So Anant is asking, what's the difference between the adenovirus and retrovirus? So I guess they might look similar under a microscope, except they're completely different species. We're gonna talk about retroviruses in a bit, but really the difference between an adenovirus and a retrovirus is that the defining feature of a retro retrovirus is that it goes from RNA to DNA. That's the way it makes the copy. And adenoviruses, they go from either DNA to RNA or RNA to RNA. So adenoviruses end up making RNA and retroviruses end up making DNA. Um, if you didn't understand that, don't worry. It was just an answer to a question that Anand asked. But yeah, if you wanted to know, that's the thing. We'll talk about it later. So um, yeah, an example of an enveloped virus, it's just covered in a protective coating and it's, it's called the herpes simplex virus. So this is the same virus that causes chicken pox, I think, a certain species of this. And it, just, it looks like this. That's another form of it. So now we can talk about how viruses make copies of themselves, how they replicate. So 
So really the way they do this is, okay, so imagine like, imagine the factory like earlier, okay? So imagine a cell is like a factory. If you remember, we have the gate to the factory, which lets some stuff in and keeps bad guys out. And you have the cytoplasm, which is where the machinery and the workers are. And that's where you make proteins. And then you have the nucleus, which is where the secret instructions are stored for how to make whatever is in the factory. And this, these instructions are sent out to the workers on the cytoplasm or at the assembly line, if you think of it like a factory. And these workers make the stuff. And but by stuff, I've been saying that a lot. You know, they make the stuff for the cell. But what I mean is proteins. So really to make a virus or actually to do anything in a cell, you need a protein to do it. So I talked about this in an earlier session, but when I say protein, I really mean any molecule that's classified as a protein, not just the stuff you get from food, which is where you might've heard protein before, but really anything you can think of in a cell that is important is done by a protein. So proteins help you break down food. They uh, help like protect the cell. They, if they have, you have a special protein in your hair called keratin that makes it rough. Um, you have special proteins in your skin called melanin that makes it dark or like have pigment, um, really anything. And your cell, all it does is, all it is is just a machine for making proteins. You can think of it that way because everything in your body at some fundamental level is done by a cell, a special cell making a special protein. So to make a virus, a virus capsid that we talked about earlier is also made of proteins. It's also made of some structural protein, which means it's a special protein that helps the virus you know, stay intact and it keeps it safe. So um, what, what this virus is doing is it wants the cell to make a copy of the viral DNA or the RNA, whatever the virus is storing. So it wants the cell to make a copy of that information and it also wants the cell to make a copy of the capsid or the special coat that is that that protects the virus. So the coat is made of protein. So it's just like what a cell would make, except that you need, it needs special instructions to make that to make that protein capsid. So really, that's where it comes in that the, the virus has to hijack the cell because the cell doesn't naturally make all this stuff. So yeah, what a virus does when it infects a cell is in the very beginning, it, it binds to the outside of the cell. So you can think of it like an intruder is coming up to the gate and they are climbing over the gate and they're getting in using a really special method. You know, Actually, instead of climbing the gate, you can think of it like they come up with, with a fake ID card and they let the guards let them inside. So a virus is just like an intruder coming into a cell. And the ID card is anything that it uses to trick the cell. So we're not going to get into it except viruses have all kinds of special molecules on their surface that let them invade a cell. So they might say, oh, I'm just coming because I'm a bit of food that the cell needs, or I'm a special delivery for the factory, something like that. So when the virus comes next to the cell, can the cell escape? So usually what the cell does, just like a factory, it has special measures in place. It has special things that it does so that intruders can't get in. That's why it has this whole membrane so that only good things can come inside and they and nothing else can stay everything else stays outside and that's really the only defense mechanism that the cell has in this case because all it can do is let the good guys in and keep the bad guys out but what the virus does is it doesn't let the cell escape or avoid taking it in because it imitates or like pretends that it's something else so if a cell knew that a virus was coming it wouldn't want to take it in but a virus has special molecules it has a signaling molecules that are bound to the virus that let it come into the cell. So usually a cell wants to take in food or something else, right? They want to take in special deliveries like that. So the virus tells the cell that it's one of those deliveries. If you want to go more in depth into it, we can, but I, was, I wasn't really planning to. So it should be like something different from a fake one and a real one. So there should be something different to when that, um, when the virus cell it uh, like disguises itself into something like food or something. There should be still something in common when he with like when he has the virus. He still has something in common that they can notice, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I I understand what you're saying. So let me go back. 
Um, one second. I'll go back and I can show you. So you see these little things protruding out of the surface? So you can think of that like a little ID badge. So the virus doesn't want to tell the cell that it's a virus because otherwise the cell won't let it in. So usually what, what food, like food is carried in packages. So you can think of like a little pouch or something that's just floating around in the, like outside of the cell and the cell sees it and it picks it up by a special ID badge and it takes it in. So that's what it does to food because food is stored in a special pouch that has an ID badge kind of thing uh, sticking out of it. And the cell grabs onto that and it reels it in into the cell. So the virus has special things like this, for example, and you can think of these like ID badges, they're fake IDs. So that's what, this, that's what the virus uses to pretend like it's a food molecule or something important. And that's why the cell grabs onto it and lets it in. So usually the cell is like evolution as it's happening, right? So evolution favors cells that can better defend themselves against these kind of viruses. But viruses always try to figure out a way to break into cells. So that's the best way I can put it, to be honest. Viruses always have to find out a way to trick the cells into letting them in using those special things that you saw protruding out of the cells. So like when they said, when you said, um, uh, there's like food at the, at the end when there's like a long stick, right? So it is like you could, uh, if there would be a vaccine to destroy that food, then then there wouldn't be like it would you the cell would easily recognize the vaccine. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand what you meant. So, what are you saying about a vaccine? Like, what should the vaccine imitate? The uh, vaccine, so it could be like it has um, it's a vaccine that could eliminate all of the uh, food at the end of the those um, those big arms that you said that were on the. The virus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, that's that's a really good idea. So, what vaccines usually do is they tell the best way I can put it is that they tell cells, okay. So when you see this, it's a fake ID. Don't let it in. Okay, that's what vaccines tell cells. They tell cells, they give cells a warning to not let someone with this ID in. So that's why if you have a vaccine, it warns the cells that there's some that there might be an intruder with a special ID identification kind of thing, uh, trying to get into the cells. And the vaccine says, "No, don't let this person in." So, and it's not food, by the way. I understand why you thought it was food, but it's really just every cell. Uh, sorry, every pouch of food inside the body. It's re it's really really tiny pouches that they're like they're like really small, the size smaller than cells. And they're just storing like a few molecules of food. And they're also tagged with a special identification badge kind of thing like this. Except what's here is actually a food molecule. So it imitates the identification badge kind of thing that is on, on the outside of a pouch of food. And it's not actually like food on the end, ends of these. That's what I meant. Yeah, Shri, you got a question? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, what do like cancer cells like I know there's like a lot of types there's like many different types of cancer but like how do they put it in like a cancer category so okay so I guess this is a good way to a good segue to talk about viruses and cancer as well um so cancer cells really all that means is that it's cells that divide uncontrollably so usually you have cells that are always dividing okay like in your healthy body there are cells that are always dividing so your skin cells die every day and they're replaced every day because your skin cells are making copies of themselves. Um, same thing with like the cells in your liver or in your intestines, okay? But um, what happens is cancer is just a classification that says a cell is going out of control. It's dividing over and over again. It's tired of listening to the orders and it just wants to divide again and again and again and again. So usually if you have cells that are dividing at a healthy rate, you won't notice. But once they become cancerous, that means that some malfunction in their instructions and in their DNA has caused them to divide again and again. And that makes what you call a tumor. So a tumor is just a clump of cells that divide uncontrollably. So they're not under the control of their DNA or anything else. They just keep on dividing, okay? So they're too many so, cells? Yeah, sorry, what? There's too many cells? Yeah. So 
um, I can't really think of an example, but there are too many cells because the cells don't want to listen to their orders and they just want to keep dividing again and again. They, they don't want to listen to their, to their DNA because their DNA has a little error in it. So the DNA doesn't tell the cells to slow down, to stop dividing because there's some error. And this error can be caused by a lot of things. So sometimes if you stay out in the sun for too long, like, a, like some people, if they stay out in the sun for too long, their DNA can get messed up in their skin just because of some chemistry that happens. So when the light strikes the DNA, it messes it up. So that means that the cell doesn't have any instructions anymore to tell it to stop dividing. So that's really just what cancer is. Something causes the cells to, to malfunction, their DNA becomes messed up, and that means that they keep dividing forever. And what the, the problem with this is that these cells that keep dividing, they need a lot of energy. So they need a lot of energy that's being taken away from healthy organs and actual tissues that you need. And instead it's going to, the, to growing this tumor. So it's just growing a clump of cells. And that clump of cells can do a lot of things. And not only does it demand energy, it can press on the brain. It can, you know, b uh, block an organ blood supply or anything like that. So like, would it affect that um, that particular part? Because I know like there's skin cancer. So like skin cancer, would it affect like, would it like have too many skin cells? Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. You just have too many skin cells. And the problem with that is it's not just skin cells. Sometimes it can break off into the blood, blood supply. Like some cancer cells can break off and they can travel all around the body. So skin cancer can spread to your brain, to your your lungs or anything like that so, so wait so how do how do they call it like so there's no virus yeah so cancer isn't is usually not always caused by viruses it's very rarely caused by viruses cancer is usually caused by a, a lot of things um it can be caused by chemicals that mess up your dna it can be caused by the sunlight messing up your skin dna um you can inhale some things like coal dust, I think. So, you know, like coal, like the black kind of coal, it has a lot of dangerous chemicals in the dust. And sometimes that can cause cancer in your lungs because that messes up the DNA. It's really just, your DNA is a, is a molecule, just like anything else in your body. So it can get damaged based on chemical processes. And that just messes it up and makes the cells keep dividing. Um, and in rare cases, like I was saying earlier, a virus can also cause cancer. So that means because the virus is messing around with the cell, it can sometimes cause the DNA to get messed up and that can cause cancer in that cell. So sometimes it can be triggered by a virus. And that's what I was saying earlier. Cancer can be caused by a lot of things, but it can also be caused by a virus, which messes up the DNA. So, so cancer uh, only is caused when your DNA is um, damaged? Yeah, that's DNA being damaged is always the fundamental cause of cancer. Cancer is caused because DNA is messed up and your cell doesn't have the right instructions to tell it to stop dividing. So okay. it doesn't have any orders to follow. Yeah, Sri Lata, okay. go ahead. Okay. So like DNA? Wait, so, sorry, sorry. Could you repeat that? I can't hear you. Can you come closer to your computer or your mic or something? Okay. Um, so it's a um, Could it multiply itself when it goes into the epithelial uh, cells in your body? Yeah, so, um, hold on, let me, one second. Yeah, uh, somebody drew something on the screen. But yeah, so epithelial cells, uh, I'll just, a good question. I'll go over epithelial cells for everyone else. So epithelial cells, cells are the cells that line, you, er, like, all the stuff that touches the outside of the body. So for example, your, they, they just line organs pretty much. Like your lungs are lined with something called epithelial cells and your, um, and your intestines are lined with that. So yeah, epithelial cells are, are a really good target for viruses because when you eat something like that's contaminated with a virus, that's where they go. Your, your, um, I kind of heard the epithelial cells are around the uh, lungs. So the uh, coronavirus basically targets the epithelial cells. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the epithelial cells are lining your lungs and they're lining your intestines and they're lining um, your mouth, the inside of your mouth. They're really a really diverse class of cells. So yeah, not only are they in your lungs, they're a really good target for viruses because epithelial cells are touching the outside of the body. So when you breathe in a virus and it touches the epithelial cells inside of your lungs, it can infect those cells and it causes you to get sick that way because the virus is coming in through the epithelial cells. And it can also- So be how does the- Yeah, go ahead. How does the viral cells, how do they get to the lung epithelial cells? Like, do they go through the epiglottis or something? Wow, good question, yeah. So it's uh, really what happens is when you breathe something in, it's going through your pharynx, your throat, and it's also going through your larynx, which is like your windpipe. So it can really, epithelial cells are lining this whole thing. So it's just a layer that's lining the inside of this whole tube. And it can go in through there. It can go in through inside the lungs. If you've heard of your alveoli, it's like the little sacs of air that are inside your lungs. It can go in through there. And um, you, it, it can really get into the body at any point throughout this. So that's why you don't want to breathe in a virus because it exposes you um, to the inside of the... Yeah, it exposes remember, you when you, cells. remember when you said alveoli? Did you say that? Like yeah, alveoli? Yeah. Oh, so I kind of thought like the alveoli contains all your... Uh, hello? Wait, sorry. I, I don't know what happened. I, I can't hear anyone anymore. Hold on. I think they got kicked out of the meeting or something. I'm not sure. Um, okay, I'll go back and let's actually move on. Uh, if they want to, if they come back and they want to ask the question, then they can go ahead. So we talked about viruses. So what they do, just a quick recap before we move on, they come into the cell, they trick the cell to making a copy of their DNA or their RNA, and they also trick the cell into making a copy of their viral coat. So this is the capsid that we talked about earlier. And inside the cell, they use the special machinery, they use the assembly line of the factory pretty much, to put the virus together and push it out. So usually what happens is either the, there's too much virus that builds up inside the cell and the cell just explodes, or the cell is just, you know, it delivers this virus to other cells in a special pouch or like here. It just assembles the virus and it leaves. So that's really how a virus infects a cell. And we already talked about this. Are viruses living or anything like that? Okay, the person named Bavish is back. So one second, I'll finish this little section and then we can talk about that. So that's pretty much it for viruses and how they work. One other thing I also wanna talk about is something called retroviruses. So, um, Someone says she can't hear me. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Ashri, sorry, you might want to turn up your uh, audio or something. But so, uh, yeah, now I'm going to talk about retroviruses. It's not part of the PowerPoint, but it's pretty important. Can you important. say something? No, no. I can't say anything. So, so, usually what a virus does is it. It takes the DNA in the center. So we're not talking about retroviruses yet, okay? Just normal viruses. It has this DNA or RNA at its center, okay? Like we said earlier. And it's covered by a protective layer of proteins. So usually the virus has DNA or RNA or something, and it copies that into something that's readable to the cell. So... There we go. So in a normal cell... You have DNA in your stored in your nucleus, like we talked about earlier, and that DNA is copied into something called RNA. One second. There we go. Yeah. So this DNA stored in the center of the cell is copied into something called RNA. So RNA is like a special copy. So um, if you have a factory that has special instructions to make a product at the very center. You want that copy. You want that. Inst you want those instructions to be copied into something else, and you want to send that out to your workers so they can follow those instructions. So in a normal cell, the way that happens is DNA is copied into RNA. RNA is like a copy, and then that's sent out to a bunch of things called ribosomes that make a copy of that. So what viruses do is they either start off with RNA, 
or they start off with DNA. And somehow they make the cell copy that into RNA so they can use that to make proteins. But a retrovirus does it the other way around. So a retrovirus, it, a retro basically means backwards. If you ever heard the word retro before talking about like old stuff like disco, retro just means backwards. So it goes the opposite direction. So like I said, um, viruses usually copy their RNA or their DNA into RNA that the cell can use to make proteins. But a retrovirus, it does it backwards. It starts off with RNA, which is like supposed to be the copy, and it makes that into DNA. So the, the same way as any other virus, it enters the cell, it breaks into the cell, and it uses this little information molecule, which is RNA, and it copies that into DNA. And the cell, all cells have DNA, right? This is what it looks like, and it's stored inside the nucleus. So this is copied into DNA by a special enzyme, which is just like a, you know, like a molecular machine. And the, since this DNA is also DNA, just like in the cell, the center of the cell, it sticks itself in to the actual DNA that the cell has. So if you think about the word genome, so genome just means all the DNA that makes you unique, right? So, um, one second, Jignesh, uh, the class ends at six, okay? Um, yeah, so DNA that makes you unique is called the genome. So it's basically all your DNA. So the human genome is all the DNA that humans have, pretty much. So what a virus does, a retrovirus, is it copies its own information into DNA, just like us. And it sticks that DNA into the, the genome of our cells. So that means that it's changing up our information. So it's like it's breaking into the factory vault and changing the instructions. So now your cell is forced to make all this extra virus, all, all these extra viruses. Every time that it divides or every time that it makes proteins, you know, it's going to be forced to also copy this virus DNA. And it's going to make that into RNA and proteins, and it's going to create these new viruses. So Shri, uh, you raised your hand, I think. You got a question? Okay. Um, you can go ahead and ask if you want. Teja is asking, so does the virus cell destroy the nucleus and DNA and make a mutation at a chance? So really, really viruses don't want to destroy the cell unless it's at it's the very end of their life cycle. So some viruses, yeah, they do destroy the cell because they make so many copies that the cell explodes. But really what most viruses are going to do is they're just going to chill, they're going to hang out in the cell, and they're going to make the cell make copies and deliver it to other cells. So most of the time, it's not going to destroy the nucleus or the DNA. It's just going to take, it's just going to make use of it. And Shri, you had a question? Yeah, um, I was going to say, like, if we don't have a certain amount of cells, does that mean, like, a virus can get into us? Um, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Like, you, you have a certain that, amount of what cells? What do you mean? Because you said that, um, like every day your cells die, and every day there's so much they make more. So yeah. Like say that, um, your thing, like it does die, but like it doesn't make, like it doesn't replace all of them. Mm -hmm. Does that mean like there's more chances of like a virus affecting you? So when I talked about cells dividing all the time, I was really talking about that in terms of cancer. Because cancer is where your cells divide, but they don't die. They just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. But for viruses, that doesn't really make a difference. It's just the viruses are, viruses infect cells, right? And those cells, if you have, and it doesn't really correlate with the number of cells that you have, if that makes sense. I was just talking about cancer because cancer is cells dividing and not stopping dividing. So cells don't die? So, yeah, cells, cells die all the time. That's why they have to divide so they can replace the dead cells. Yeah, I know. My question was, like, if they don't, and, like, if they aren't, like, replacing that place of the cell that dies, then would there be, like, more chances where a virus could have more, like, chances to affect you? I, I think I know what you mean. So, actually, in some special cases, yeah. So, in your bone marrow, so bone marrow is a special substance that's at the center of your bone, like inside your bones. 
And bone marrow is where all the special cells in your blood are made, including the cells called white blood cells that fight off viruses. So if those, those cells are really sort of like the soldiers in your body and they protect you from getting sick because they fight against viruses that come inside. And those cells, if you don't have enough of them in your body, then you're going to get sick because you're always surrounded by viruses and everything. And if you don't have any soldiers to fight them off, which are white blood cells, then that means that you're going to, you're going to get sick at some point. Um, in, in that case, if you have, yeah, sorry, what? So you're um, like very rare that that happens? Yeah, so the only reason in which having not enough cells would make you more likely to get a virus is if your white blood cell count is low. So if you have, if your bone marrow cells are dying and they can't make enough white blood cells, which fight off viruses, then that means that you're more likely to get infected with the virus. And a lot of dangerous diseases, they affect bone marrow. Like if you have cancer in your bone marrow, it can... Oh, oh sorry, someone is talking, I don't know. But yeah, so if you have some disease that affects your bone marrow, then it can cause you to get bad, not enough white blood cells. Sorry, the person in Bawe is just trying to ask a question. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. Go ahead. So that means that like the bone marrow, if it gets attacked by the virus, then there's going to be less um, red blood cells in your body that are produced. So all of your red blood cells will get like... Um, Maybe if you have cancer, then the cancer will attack the bone marrow, or the cancer also the cancer um takes out all the red blood cells. So if um the cancer like takes the red blood cells, it keeps doing that, then the red blood cells will decrease faster, and the uh there's no bone marrow to like create new ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if a disease like that attacks the bone marrow and you can't make enough white blood cells. So not red blood cells in this case, white blood cells, um, then that means that you're not going to be able to fight off a virus when it comes. Exactly. Good job. Um, so I'm just going to wrap this up really quick. So uh, if you just want to see a quick little, you know, demonstration kind of thing. So a virus attaching to the surface, in this case, it's a bacteriophage, so it's infecting bacteria, but it's the same process. It attaches to the surface, it injects the material in, and then this genetic material is just copied over and over again, and it creates new viruses. And it, you can see that they're getting put together. They're, they're getting assembled like robots in a factory. And then at one point, the bacteria just bursts open, releasing a bunch of new viruses. So this is one way that viruses can infect bacteria. And this holds true for other kinds of cells as well. But in some cases, they can, they can hide inside the cell. So they can hide inside bacteria. And by hide, I mean that they stay inside. They're, they're really quiet. And at some point, they all cop they all they make a bunch of copies all at once. So it attaches to the surface of bacteria. It injects its material in just like before. But in this case, the virus has its genetic material, so the DNA. It's in it becomes part of the genome of the bacteria. So like I said before, with a retrovirus, where the DNA becomes part of the human DNA, the yeah, so Anath is asking, do they actually stay inside or adjust their genetic material? Yeah, so just their genetic material. So the virus can die or get degraded or whatever, but what's important is that their genetic material, the, R, the DNA here, becomes part of the DNA of the bacteria. So does the, um, so is there like, if there's a virus, if there's, if there's like, they're not like living good, they're not like, um, how do I say it? So they're not really like affecting the body very good. They're not like harming the body good. So if one of those type of cells, if they like start a new group and like do it bit better, could that happen? Or do you mean like if a virus is not really making you sick, it can just camp out inside the body and get you sick later? No, I mean, like, if one of those cells just start a new type of, like, for example, cancer. There's many cancer cells in the body. Then one of those cancer cells, they get out, and then they make a new group that lives better. Yeah. And comes yeah. up, like, the whole spread more. Yeah, so it seems like we're talking about cancer a lot today. That wasn't really the plan of this. And, yeah, Arjun, we're, we're not going to send the PowerPoint, but we're going to send a recording later. It's going to be on our YouTube channel, which we'll send at the end of the meeting. And, yeah, so... Now, when I'm, we're talking about cancer, yeah, 
it can break, you can have some cells break off into the blood supply. So in your bloodstream, they're going to travel all around the body, like cancer cells, and they're going to grab onto somewhere else in your body. And they're going to make a lot of copies. So um, an example of this. Yeah. So yes, they are malignant tumors. Someone said that in the chat. But when that happens, does it kill the, um, the, the uh, original one? No, it doesn't. So in this case, here, I'll show you here. So what we, this is called a special word called, I don't know how you, I don't know how you pronounce it, metastasis or metastasis. So if you have a cancer, like some cells just in this part of your body, in the large intestine, they just keep growing and growing. Sometimes they can break off into the blood supply at some point. They can travel all around the body and new cancer cells can come from the blood. You can see that they travel all around and they can form a new group here or here. And this one doesn't die. It just keeps growing and this part keeps growing and this part keeps growing. And that's how cancer spreads all over the body. So when it dies out, could there be like a filter to stop it from coming into the bloodstream? Um, I don't know about a filter because it's cells just like any other cells. Like they're the same size as red blood cells. So you can't really filter that stuff out. The really best way to handle cancer is to, is to kill the cancer with like radiation or chemicals or something while it's still in that stage where it hasn't spread around the body yet. Um, it's six. Yeah, it's six o'clock. So, so if anyone wants to leave, oh, I'll just go over this one thing really quick and then I think we're done. So um, a hidden virus, it just camps out inside and at some point, it's after like a year or after two years or maybe after like a few days, it just comes outside and it makes copies of itself and it explodes. So this is the kind of virus that just hides inside the body. And this is, in this case, it's a bacteria. So before you leave, if, you're, if you have to leave, I'll send you these two things. Um, so if you look in the Zoom chat, I sent two links. So the first one is to a cool little website that lets you explore viruses. It lets you click on a bunch of different types of viruses and look at, their, um, look at what diseases they cause. And the second one is a little video and a few questions. And you can just watch the video. It's a good review of what we talked about today with viruses. And um, it talks about how viruses infect cells and what you can do with, you know, looking at viruses and studying them. So just save those two links if you want to, you know, check it out later. Um, I hope you check it out because there's some cool stuff on there we didn't get to go over in this meeting. Uh, and Saloni, can you send the participation log link thing? Uh, so Saloni will be sending that in a bit. So before you leave, if you're going to leave, then um, make sure you click that link that Saloni is going to send in a bit and fill that out. So that way you can get points for coming and you can go up in our leaderboard ranks. Um, so while Saloni is sending that link and everything, uh, yeah, there we go. She just sent it. So if you go in the Zoom chat, just click that and fill that form out. You'll get points for coming. So yeah. One important thing I wanted to talk about before we leave is that viral diseases, like usually with bacteria, you can take antibiotics and it'll make you better. But really with viruses, there's no cure for viral infections that we know so far. Um, there's really only drugs that can attack viruses and make it easier for your body to fight them. But there's nothing that can fight them like antibiotics. There's nothing that can make you all better immediately. So that's a really important thing that scientists are researching. They're trying to find out drugs that can actually cure viruses. And that's why they say there's, they usually say there's no cure for the common cold, right? Because the common cold is caused by a virus. And really, yeah, that's, that's just all I wanted to talk about today. Hopefully you can click those links and learn some more stuff. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming guys. So any I, questions? I can't like, click the link. Like I can't really see the link at all. Uh, can you go to the Zoom chat, maybe? Like, can you see yeah, the Zoom I chat? Can. Yeah, but it's not there. It's just saying the form to, yeah, it's just saying the form to um, put points. That's all. Okay. Um, let me send them again. And yeah, so okay. Anand was asking, I think it maybe applies for a bunch of other people. Uh, if you've attended a bunch of classes, but you haven't had a chance to fill out the forms, it's okay if you just fill the form out multiple times. So just yeah, and I sent you the, the email of like that um, 
yesterday, remember, I guess. For uh, like you were saying about the coding thing. Uh huh. Yeah, you didn't really keep points for that for me. Like, or are you supposed to keep points? I don't know. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll we'll deal with that. Thanks for emailing us. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I saw it or if Saloni saw it, but yeah, we'll we'll deal with it. Thanks for reminding us. Yeah. Um, so any other questions? Wait. So the person who was just talking. I'm not sure who you are because your name is not there. But did you did you oh. get to access the Zoom thing in the chat? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So I think we'll end the meeting now.